It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce um, Chris Casper, uh, who is going to introduce the final keynote speaker of the day. Uh, Chris is the uh, President and Chief Executive Officer of Harvest Power, uh, a company dedicated to helping communities achieve organic sustainability through recycling, clean energy, and soil revitalization. Uh, Harvest has grown rapidly since its founding in 2008 and today manages over two million tons of organics annually and operates some of the largest organics to energy anaerobic digesters in North America. And we just found out that we have some friends in common as well from, from prior lives, so I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Chris Casper. Thank you, Cliff. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce today's featured speaker, who is going to be sharing her thoughts on where do we go from here. It's quite the question, and I think we're all interested in the answer, uh, particularly after what I think was a very interesting series of discussions, uh, in many ways that raised more questions than answers, and so we're looking for some from our next presenter. Um, it's a keen area of topic, uh, keen area of interest for everybody in this room, but I think the answer is actually more important, more important than just methane, or more important than just California. Because I think the answer impacts everyone who's concerned about what can be done to, ta to tackle the threats of smog, toxic air pollution, and climate change. Well, we've made some real progress, but there's a lot of work left to be done. Smog continues to plague our urban centers, many of which have yet to meet standards that were set decades ago. According to an MIT study, air pollution still causes 200,000 deaths per year in the United States. Greenhouse gases, including those produced by more than 50 million tons of food landfilled annually, continue to change our climate. These and many other challenges we face in today's carbon economy. But despite these challenges, there's cause for optimism. The crescendo of public awareness continues to build. The world recently convened in Paris for the COP21 conference to address global warming. In the US, words like green energy, renewable fuels, organic sustainability are starting to enter the public lexicon. Private capital is poised to invest once certain barriers are removed, and policymakers are leading the charge and implementing tougher regulations. Which is why our next presenter's remarks are so important, not just for the future of California, but for the entire country. To most of you, she requires no introduction. She has been dubbed the Queen of Green for her environmental leadership. Her advocacy began early in her career as a young lawyer, she filed the first case under the Federal Clean Air Act in California with the mantra, you gotta admit less. She was then appointed to the California Air Resources Board by Governor Jerry Brown and quickly rose to become its chair. She went on to found the Los Angeles Office of the National Resource Defense Council. During the Clinton administration, she worked at the US EPA where she ran a cap and trade program to reduce emissions of sulfur dioxide and acid rain. In 2007, she was again appointed to lead the Air Resources Board, this time by the then Republican Governor Schwarzenegger. Through her dedication to public service over the past four decades, she's touched the lives of millions of Californians. She helped make the air we breathe cleaner, and more recently, rolled up her sleeves and tackled the arduous work of implementing AB 32. There are few people in public service who have done so much to create long-term significant change that benefits public health, expands the economy, and achieves important environmental protections. She has successfully worked to not only reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but help stimulate a sustainable green economy. We are very fortunate to have her at the helm, guiding California, and creating a role model for the rest of the United States. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to the Queen of Green and the Chair of the California Air Resources Board, Mary Nichols. Uh, 
Wow, after that introduction, I think it's time to go drink. Um, however, we've got one more speech to go through today for all of you who've been here all day. Thank you for taking the time and for those of you who traveled in particular to share your expertise with the rest of the group. Uh, this, is, this is an important and timely uh, topic. So, uh, Today, you've heard a lot about the promise, as well as the barriers, that are associated with increasing the supply and use of renewable natural gas in California. And um, sometimes I feel like this is a, it's one of those weird Jeopardy type games where we have the answer. The question is, what is the question? The answer is the renewable natural gas. The question is, what's the question? How are we gonna fit it into all of the various different kinds of uh, thoughts that it could, it could be the answer to. So I'm not going to uh, uh, repeat what you've already heard, at least I hope I'm not, uh, but I do want to provide some perspective on where I see these issues heading, at least with respect to the Air Resources Board and uh, the climate program that we are implementing here in California. 2016 is, in many ways, a year of planning at the Air Resources Board. Among the things that we're working on are a mobile source strategy and a state implementation plan, a sustainable freight action plan, a short-lived climate pollutant plan, and a 2030 scoping plan for reaching our uh, goals for greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, by 2030. Each of these planning efforts looks out to 2030 and it takes, uh, it takes us through a series of steps that we need to uh, walk through over the next 15 years in order to stay on a path to uh, continue the fight against climate change and to meet federal health-based air quality standards, our twin stars that we're trying to navigate to. And each of these plans also discusses and prioritizes various technologies and policies that we need to uh, use uh, to get to those goals. And while it's just one piece of our very broad framework and our agenda, in many ways, renewable natural gas is a thread that runs through all of these different efforts. Many of us have differences of opinion about exactly how best we feel that we should utilize it or how uh, we can get to our air quality and climate targets. But I don't really think that anybody uh, disagrees that uh, we're going to be continuing to rely on combustion for some time into the future, certainly to 2030, in the heavy duty sector, and that in applications that can't easily be electrified, we should be using renewable fuels in engines that produce the lowest possible emissions of nitrogen oxides and particulate matter. And the same is true for buildings and uses uh, it within buildings, the end uses, or industrial operations that can't easily be electrified. And there's also a lot of potential value in organic waste streams, such as food waste and dairy manure that we were just talking about, that we have the ability to capture, but are currently letting waste away in landfills or elsewhere. So these are kind of common uh, elements that I think uh, run across the, the areas that people are debating about. So renewable gas can be a key element that delivers progress in each, of these, uh, in each of these areas. But the key, as you've heard several times today, is to knock down barriers and to get the renewable gas into the pipeline. Once it's in the pipeline, it becomes a commodity where the market, guided uh, to some extent, of course, by policy, can decide what its highest value is. It could be in an ultra low NOx truck, it may be in a fuel cell car, or it could be helping to power a university campus or a hospital or a manufacturing plant. 
we don't have to pick the end use, but we need to enable the opportunity. Now, you've also heard a lot about ways that this could happen and about the obstacles and why it can be tough. But I think that the biggest barrier still remains a, a collective or um, consensus kind of will in this area. We get bogged down in the debate over the details and fail to recognize that on the big picture item, we have to pull together. We can fund low NOx natural gas trucks using renewable fuel. We, I'm speaking now about the state of California here. We can increase utility support for pipeline interconnection or any number of other things. Any or all of them may very well be worth doing. But we're not going to really get to any kind of a sustainable program here unless we agree that climate change and air pollution are worth solving and that we can solve them. So if we could do that, if we could provide certainty about the durability and the longevity of our climate programs and the markets that they have just begun to create and the commitment, all of these things will happen renewable gas will start flowing and our communities will become healthier and also, as we know, our economy will continue to grow. But our collective consensus, our collective will, is being tested in various ways right now. It seems like we go through these kind of periodic cycles of rethinking. Um, I've been rethinking some of these issues to the point where I've got a headache, frankly. Uh, you know, rethinking is hard work, and sometimes you actually need to decide that you've rethunk enough and that it's time to actually move on. Now, we have uh, a lot of discussions going on right now here in California, uh, and much of it is uh, based on the question of whether we're going to continue or renew uh, our commitment to climate change and to extend AB 32 to make the administration's goals and the, and the nation's goals and the world's goals and the science goals for 2030, the law of California. And we're also having a lot of debates about short-lived climate pollutants. I think both Senator Lara and Governor Brown deserve a lot of credit for putting short-lived climate pollutants on the international agenda and elevating it into the discussion. Uh, and that's an important, uh, an important piece of all of this. When we first started out at ARB just a couple of years ago to talk about short-lived climate pollutants in a major way, realizing that this was an area of opportunity which um, we needed to focus on. Uh, this was a very strange concept to uh, many people that were working in the climate space, and some thought it was a diversion from the focus on uh, carbon dioxide. But two years later, I think anybody who's been following the climate discussion in California appreciates that short-lived climate pollutants need to be a part of our strategy as we fight climate change because we're simply not gonna get to the reductions that we need in time if all we focus on is the uh, more traditional greenhouse gases. And so it's an essential part of our efforts on climate change. And I think that um, we want it to be part of our agenda <clears throat> because these are some of the lowest cost greenhouse gas emissions reductions that we can get and with some additional very valuable health benefits as well as quick uh, climate benefits. So our draft short-lived climate pollutant plan shows how renewable gas can facilitate reductions of short-lived climate pollutants like methane in California and coupled with other climate programs like the low carbon fuel standard or our cap and trade efforts these efforts to cut methane emissions at dairies and elsewhere in California could bring billions of dollars in new revenues into our agricultural and other communities and help them address local water quality and air quality problems as well. 
Governor Brown was on point in Paris when he said, this is probably the most immediate challenge and the most important thing to do leaving this conference. Short-lived climate pollutants are something we can tackle. And he led a whole uh, room full of uh, rather cautious diplomats into uh, you know, rousing commitment on this front. So if anything can unite us uh, related to climate change, it ought to be a unifying theme here uh, that this is something that we can rally people around, that bringing people together around the need to control and to capture and reuse and generally not waste uh, these resources that are also uh, damaging our climate is something that we can do. Now, some say, and some of the people who we think are the beneficiaries of these kinds of thinking that we're doing, um, that we can't meet our short-lived climate pollutant goals, even while they acknowledge that there's some of the lowest cost reductions available. And I guess my response to that would be that the term can't do it is actually not allowed in California. If there ever was a place where we don't buy it, that things can't be done in California, uh, this, is, this is it. Now, the solutions are in front of us, and I don't think we can allow that argument that it's too hard, it's too expensive, there are too many barriers. We tried it, and it didn't work. Somebody else tried it, and it didn't work. So therefore, we just can't even begin to talk about this. I think that that was what the whole effort that finally came together in Paris was all about, was saying that there's a tremendous power in getting together in one voice and saying it can work and we're committed to doing it and we're going to do it and we're going to do it together. So I think that our task coming out of Paris is to translate that global commitment into real world action, real world action. We're up to the task, and fortunately, I think we have many people in California, including many of our elected officials and a governor, who really are committed and who want to see California moving forward. So we're gonna be continuing on our transition to clean energy and to clean vehicles and cleaner fuels and we're also going to be venturing into new spaces like the short-lived climate pollutants. We're gonna to have to focus on some issues that are sometimes difficult or possibly even funny to talk about. And I love the last panel because, you know, in my world, most of the time we're talking about parts per million or maybe we're talking about technologies that most people can't pronounce. But when you're talking about the toilet and the shower and the garbage disposal and what's going into them. You're talking about stuff that people can really relate to here. And this is a good thing because we need to talk about how we manage manure. And we need to talk about manure at dairies. And at ARB, we are actually starting to talk about this in a serious way, using 20-year climate accounting because doing this would generate emissions reductions that are about on the order of some of our largest climate programs. So this is serious stuff. It's serious emissions, it's serious opportunity. But we have to do it in a way, and, and we get it, that builds on our agricultural heritage, the agricultural economy, the challenges that that industry faces, and allows this industry to thrive while also improving regional air quality and water quality. Got to find a way to match up the incentives with the challenge and not to assume that there's any one technology that's going to solve the problem for everybody. So that's, that's first on, on the list as far as I'm concerned. We're committed to coming up with the package that will do it. We have to develop the regulatory tools because we need them as part of our backstop and as part of our commitment to doing our job as regulators, but we need to make sure that to the maximum extent possible, we can make it work without having people have to 
um, do it just because regulations uh, called upon them and required them to do so. And there are a number of other examples like this with uh, organics across the board. So I guess what I want to do in kind of uh, trying to put a bow around the topics that you've been talking about today is that we have taken on, we Californians and all of you who are from California and now really the, the country, um, the challenge of trying to keep the global temperature from rising more than one and a half degrees Celsius, which it's already pretty close to, because not to do that is to admit that a whole way of life and a whole segments of our planet are not going to be able to continue to live as they do today. We believe that we have opportunities within that challenge and that in a way it's a kind of a space race, it's a kind of a Manhattan project to pull together all the necessary funds and incentives and uh, regulations and technologies to actually do it, to really get serious about climate change. And we need to, to do it in a way that brings in everybody because there's no, no sector, no community, no area that, uh, that isn't touched by this uh, problem. So I think we need to commit ourselves to this concept of a space race. I've seen a lot of interesting um, behavior happen when you have something like an X Prize, or you have a moon project or a Manhattan project, and you put out a goal that admittedly is a hard goal, but it's one that you have good reason to believe that it could be solved if everybody would pull together. Uh, right now, I've been reading quite a bit about the fact that uh, suddenly Mars is on everybody's radar screen. And everybody from George Bush to President Obama has decided that the next big challenge is for a manned flight to Mars by the mid-2030s. Even Ted Cruz is saying that our Mars ambitions are, are, are worthy. Um, I'm not quite sure what it is about the red planet that uh, you know is so inspiring to people, but um, you know I I think that's fine. Uh, there are private companies like Lockheed Martin and SpaceX that are already stepping up and are trying to find ways that they can get in on the action and push this progress even faster and even perhaps uh, push the deadline forward uh, by about a decade. And one of, I'm sure, all of our California uh, luminaries, Ellen, uh, Elon Musk, has uh, actually um, pushed the envelope as usual, saying that he thinks we could land a person on Mars by 2025. Well, I think we could do something perhaps more meaningful than that. Um, and that is that we could actually achieve uh, major reductions in greenhouse gases and solve our short-lived climate pollutant program. We could slash emissions of short-lived climate pollutants, including methane, in half within that same uh, time frame. And all we need are the same things. We need uh, some certainty from the regulatory uh, bodies. We need financing. We need a broad base of support. We need political commitment. So, you know, let's make this into a little bit of a competition. Which comes first, a human being on Mars or composting food scraps and, and taking care of all the cow poop in water? I mean, come on, let's, let's set up a race here between those two things. Um, I think it could be pretty interesting to see whether we get to capture the energy first from all of our waste versus whether we get a person on Mars. And I think it would be a good competition, and I think we should uh, actually uh, engage in it starting uh, right now. So I'm asking all of you to join me. First step is somebody's got to think of a name for this, right? Um, for this collective effort. And the first person who comes up with a great name uh, gets a free drink from me. So thank you all uh, for listening. Thanks for uh, being uh, part of this great effort uh, because it is a great effort and we need you all together to be helping to push it forward. Thanks very much. 
My name is Mike Sharkey uh, with Gain Clean Fuel from uh, Wisconsin. And um, listening today, one thought that passed through my head um, was uh, when somebody mentioned that a great deal of the volume of RNG produced today is produced outside the state of California. And I'm wondering why um, California recognizes or is willing to recognize the production of RNG in another state under its uh, program here. So, thanks. Oh, <laughs> well, I mean, constitutionally, we can't discriminate against fuels that are based on where they are made. The whole, the whole program, the whole low carbon fuel standard is based on the premise that there's a life cycle of emissions. And so if something is produced in another place, there are transportation costs that are assessed to it. There may be other costs based on the way in which it's produced and the fuels that were used. But uh, it, would not be, uh, it would not be legal for us, even if we wanted to, to say you can't, uh, tame, you can't participate in this program just because you produced out of state. But I guess I'm not, I understand that piece. I'm wondering what benefit of it, what benefit is there to California though? If, I mean, I don't believe, and maybe I'm wrong here, but the production of RNG, let's say in Indiana, those molecules of RNG aren't reaching California, right? Oh, well, you know, our program isn't designed just Thanks. to benefit California either. I mean, it's true that we have chosen to take on a, a climate goal um, at the time of AB 32, the goal was to reach the same level of emissions reductions as the Kyoto Treaty, so a reduction to 1990 levels by 2020, which based on business as usual was about a 40% reduction in emissions. And we took responsibility for our own emissions, including emissions of electricity that is actually generated outside of California if it's brought into the state. But our idea was that we were doing this not alone to prove that you know we were better than other people. It was to show you could do it and get others to join. Now, if other states or other countries get the advantage of our lower carbon fuels or lower carbon methods, that's wonderful. It's all helping the planet, even if it doesn't necessarily uh, have all the other uh, benefits of producing right in California. But we have other, you know, other programs that are designed to get people to produce things in California, too. It's an interesting question. Yes, sir. The gentleman in the white shirt over there. <laughs> Hi. That, uh, um, that the Air Resources Board can develop many programs that will benefit not just the state of California, but the, the globe uh, through the fight against climate change. Uh, and, and one of the things that I wanted to, to, to just ask your um, opinion and, and, and advice on is uh, the state's coming under tremendous pressure from the Western States Petroleum Association. Uh, they don't want to see SB 32 pass. They don't want to see our authority extend into 2030. Our industry does. We are with you. We want to support you. We, we support your vision, not just in, um, in the low carbon fuel standard and the cap and trade, uh, but we also support your vision uh, in the SIP that you're pulling together. Um, what, is, what is the parting advice uh, that you could give to us? What would be of most benefit for you uh, in terms of support from this industry? Well, um, first of all, I think the most important message that you can impart, those of you who are doing business in the state of California in any, in any way, uh, uh, is to talk to members and or their staffs about what you do and why what you do is creating jobs and creating other revenues and doing good things for the state of California because you can't, uh, you cannot possibly underestimate the, the lack of awareness that's out there. Just because we think we know things and we read publications and we talk to other people who know them really doesn't mean that everybody else does. And that's particularly true for elected officials who have to focus on a lot of other things, um, you know, including getting themselves reelected. So I think it would be terrific to organize you know, whatever combination of visits and hosting tours or hosting 
lunches or breakfasts or you know whatever to bring people in to talk about the benefits of the low carbon fuel standard in particular um, and the tie-in between air pollution and climate because another message that has kind of gotten lost almost from the beginning of AB 32 is that climate is a form of pollution it's global admittedly it's not so much local, but it builds on the local pollution. And it's actually, in many ways, the solutions are the same. Not all of them are identical, but in general, better use of energy, not allowing things to be wasted that can be reused, that is really at the core of a sustainable strategy for our, uh, for our energy and for our, our economy as a whole. So I think the, this room is full of people who have wonderful stories to tell and, um, and are heroes in their own way, because in many cases they've done this with you know, very little in the way of public support. Um, hopefully they can also say and show that, you know, incentive programs like LCFS are, are beneficial and could do even more uh, if they had them. We are of the view that the program needs to be reauthorized because without it, we're going to be subject to litigation forever. So I know you'll hear opinions from other people that, um, you know, a majority vote bill is fine, it's okay if ARB just continues to do the program on its own, and, you know, we probably can carry on that way. We certainly are determined that we're not going to, you know, we're not going to give up and, and walk away. But I think it's really important that at this point in our history, if you look at, you know, what happened with the, the last auction in the cap and trade program, it wasn't a, a failure because suddenly uh, there was some problem with the cap and trade program. The main problem was that the people who are subject to having to buy allowances um, had enough allowances that they bought at a cheaper price on the, on the private market and that um, the private market is very, very nervous about the future of this program. They need to see a reaffirmation. So, you know, I, I can do my best to send messages of reassurance, but we really need the legislature to step up and do that. Okay, thank you. Well, that was an outstanding way to conclude what I hope all of you agree was a really terrific program here at Rethink Methane 2016. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of information. Uh, some of you said it was like drinking from a fire hose. Uh, some of it provocative, uh, all of it thought provoking. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we hope that you enjoyed yourselves. Uh, again, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors. Uh, at this point, I'd like to thank uh, Waste Management, who is the sponsor of the lovely reception which awaits you all when you exit these doors. Uh, thank you all very, very much for coming, and I hope that we see you all again next year at Rethink Methane 2017. Thank you. Thank you.